Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 178. I'm your host, Eric Moore. This week, we're going to be talking about what is the deal with the strength in the U.S. dollar? Why is everybody all of a sudden talking about it, although they really should have been talking about it for a while? It's been strong for a while. And we're starting to hear murmurs about, hey, I don't know if uh, this is going to impact earnings or not. All these multinational companies who do get revenues overseas. I think Microsoft warned their revenues would be down. I think it's uh, a little bit of their earnings. They, they've already done that. So why now? And then why, what are they talking about here? Well, we're going to answer those questions. I'm going to give you some, some examples of, you know, and I'll, I'm going to simplify it for you because sometimes I know everyone thinks, you know, oh, you know, I'm going on a trip to Mexico and I need to change my dollars for pesos at the airport, that type of thing. But it's a little more involved when you're talking about trade and where companies get their revenues from and also where they source their products from. And so, and maybe a little bit of surprising data I saw from FactSet that might disprove some of these worries about the, the strong U.S. dollar. The first thing is, okay, when we say the, the dollar is strong, what are they talking about? Well, there's a few ways to look at this. There's really three primary ways. Uh, the first way is you would look and see, okay, let me look at the, the U.S. dollar versus, let's say, the Japanese yen. Or I would look at the U.S. versus the euro. The euro, of course, is an amalgamation of a bunch of different countries, right? And so you could do that. And one of the ways that you do that, well, let me get to that later. The other way is you look at the U.S. dollar index. And there's really two different ones. The third way is a U.S. trade-weighted dollar index. But the, the Dixie or the DXY... Uh, that's sort of the, the acronym people give it because of the symbol. That is made up of a basket of currencies and are weighted. So think about like an index, like a stock index. But these have currencies in them. And right now, currently, the euro has a 57.6%, call it 58% weight. Japanese yen, roughly 14%. Uh, British pound, 12%. Canadian dollar, about 9%. Swedish krona, a little over 4%. Swiss franc, about 3.5%. And so one of the first things you see here is you say, okay, I see euro. I see pound sterling. That's the British pound. I see kronas from Sweden. And I see Swiss francs. Aren't those com uh, countries all in Europe? That's right. And so... One of the things about this index, it's really Eurocentric. Uh, by my calculations, it's over 77% of the Euro, uh, of this index is made up of countries from Europe. And the remaining ones, you know, obviously the, the difference there, uh, you have the Japanese yen, the Canadian dollar. So one of the, the knocks on this index is, hey, this is only looking at a really specific area, although Europe's a big area, it's a continent, uh, it's really only how is the U.S. dollar doing against the European currencies. And so the, I think it was the late 90s, they came up with a trade-weighted U.S. dollar index. And this one resets, I believe it's annually, and I'll put a link to it, the, uh, the Federal, Reserve, Federal Reserve Board of Governors site, they have uh, FederalReserve.gov, but I'll put the link to the specific area. And it's a broad index of foreign exchange value of the dollar. And these get updated every year. So you can look on this uh, screen and you can see going back to, I think it's 2006 here. And the idea is that they, they weight these for how much trade happens between the U.S. and these different countries. So unlike the the pure dollar index, the trade-weighted dollar index, has, okay, they have uh, China is about 14.7%. They've got, uh, let's see, some differences here. Mexico, 13.25%. Euro area is only a little under 20%. So that's that's kind of the difference, um, you know, when you're looking at these, these two indexes. And the reason why the trade-weight 
weighted one is is preferred by some people, although usually the dollar index is the one you see quoted on CNBC. It said it's more of re, a reflection of the trade, meaning when you trade with countries, meaning you sell stuff in other countries and they pay in their currency and then you convert it back to dollars, that type of stuff. This this matters a little bit more. So I wanted to get that kind of out there first and just kind of talk about the the different metrics that you can kind of look at. Now I mentioned before you can look directly and and really it's a it's a it's a you know one country versus another. And the way these are listed, usually let's let's use uh, uh, U.S. dollars, Japanese yen. And so if you look at a quote of this, you see USD slash JPY, okay? And so if it goes from 103, it's the one you list second is how many of that currency you need to get one dollar of the, the first currency. So when you see USD slash JPY at 103, you need 103 yen to get one U.S. dollar. If the dollar strengthens, it means now you need more yen, you need more of that other currency to get that same U.S. dollar. So now the U.S. dollar slash uh, Japanese yen is 133. That means now you need 133, where before you needed 103 yen to get one U.S. dollar. That's an example of a currency of a U.S. dollar strengthening because now you need more of that foreign currency to get that same U.S. dollar. Now, sometimes they confuse you, and it's not really that confusing, uh, but you might not list the U.S. dollar first. You might list the, the other currency first, and that's the case with the euro and the U.S. dollar. Typically, you see the euro slash U.S. dollar or EUR slash USD. And so if that's 150 that means you need 150, no, sorry, fifty to get that one euro. And let's say the dollar strengthens. Here the dollar strengthens. And remember before it was more yen to get that same dollar. But now because the euro is first, let's say it's euro slash dollar is now one. We call that parity, meaning it's one for one. And back a few days ago, we were pretty much at parity. So in that case, now the dollar has strength and now you need less dollars to get that same one euro. So instead of a dollar fifty gets you one euro, now one US dollar gets you one euro, okay? So why does this all matter? Well, I think Microsoft, some other companies, they've said, hey, this strong dollar may hurt our revenues and it may filter down to earnings. And I'm gonna give you an example here. Let's say that you're selling something and you're a U.S.-based company and you're selling a product, doesn't matter what it is, for 10 euros. Okay. So you sell it in Europe for, for 10 euros. And then when you repatriate those revenues back to the U.S., if, it, if the exchange rate is, is $1.50, it means when you sell something for 10 euros, convert it back to U.S. dollars, it's $15 U.S. dollars that you got for that sale. So your revenues are $15 U.S. And this is an important point because U.S.-based companies, anywhere they sell things around the globe, they report their earnings in U.S. dollars, all right? So now let's say it's one-to-one. -one. They sell that same item still for 10 euros, and now when it's converted back to U.S. dollars, well, it's not converted to $15. It's converted to $10 U.S. And so if that's the only thing you sold, we're not talking about net profit margins, but if that's the only thing you sold, your revenues would go down 50%. Okay, and that's a ridiculous example. Of course, com companies are selling many things across many different countries. But that's kind of the idea. So... That's, that's one of the reasons why some of these companies are warning about revenues, all right? And by the way, I know you're all thinking it, and if we were in a room together, you'd ask me, wait a second, what about inflation? You can't be selling things for that same 10 euros, right? Aren't prices up? Yes, they are. Of course they are. But I wanted to isolate this just on a currency basis, okay? So that's the revenue side, 
But let's explore the pricing angle too. Let's say that you're banking in as a U.S. company. You need 15 bucks in U.S. dollars for each of these widgets that you sell in unnamed Europe country. Okay, so if you still want to get that same $15 back, you would have to raise your price now from 10 euros to 15 euros. And one of the downfalls of a strong U.S. dollar, especially for companies that are exporters, they're exporting things outside the U.S., they're selling them outside the U.S., in theory, their products become more expensive. And when things are more expensive to import, demand can go down. And so that's sort of the, uh, the problem there for a lot of these, these companies. Now, it gets a little complicated because the U.S. doesn't necessarily make everything and pay in U.S. dollars to create it and make it and manufacture it and then ship it overseas to, uh, uh, to Europe and sell it there. All right, sticking with our, our original example. Let's imagine that they're selling that, that thing for, I don't know, let's, let's say it's uh, essentially now, you know, 10 bucks, right? Let's, let's use an example. Imagine they're manufacturing uh, this widget in Japan. Okay, so let's, let's move to Japan now. So we say, okay, we're going to sell something in $10 US. And, but we're going to manufacture it in Japan, and let's say the U.S. dollar, Japanese yen is 103. All right, what does that mean? It means 206 yen equal $2. So let's say a U.S. company says, okay, hello, uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Japanese uh, businessman or businesswoman. Uh, we'd like you to manufacture this for us. They say, great, fantastic. We'd love to do that. Uh, and what's your cost per item? Well, our cost is 206 yen. Okay, do the math. That's two bucks. Okay, great. We're going to sell this thing for 10 US. It costs us $2 after we convert the 206 yen at a, a conversion rate of 103 yen to the dollar back to two bucks. We make eight bucks. That's an 80% net profit margin or eight bucks net profit margin. Okay. Sounds good. We like this. Now, what happens though, and all else equal, and it never really is, but let's say that we're making the same widget in Japan, but now the U.S. dollar, Japanese yen, the exchange rate is 133. That means the dollar is strengthening. Now, instead of 103 yen to get one U.S. dollar, now you need 133 yen to get one U.S. dollar. All right, so, but they, their manufacturing is in Japan. And so they're charging the 206 yen for every item. We say, ooh, a strong dollar in this case helps us. Why? Well, because they're charging 206 yen, but now at 133 yen to one US dollar exchange rate, it's only costing us a dollar fifty-five US dollars because the dollar got stronger. All right, now we're onto something. Now it's ten dollars minus our dollar fifty-five cost. Now our cost to manufacture this widget is less expensive. Now our net profit is $8.45 or uh, an 84.5% net profit margin. All right, now we're getting somewhere. In fact, uh, this little exchange rate fluctuation has increased our profits by about 5.6%. Pretty cool. It gets a little bit more complicated when we say, well, let's manufacture in Japan, sell in Europe, and then so we pay and uh, we convert to yen, which is cheaper of a, for us to manufacture things. And then we sell it in Europe. Let's say it's 10 euros. And now we repatriate back to US dollars. Now we're only getting, you know, our 10 bucks here. And I'm confusing you because I went from euros to dollars. Uh, but you kind of kind of get the idea. So that's that's a, a few examples of yeah, strong dollar can help in cases because your buying power goes up. You're able to buy more stuff at cheaper prices. But on the flip side, assume that we aren't moving the price around, our revenues go down 
from our overseas sales when the U.S. dollar is strong. All right, so that's kind of what they're talking about. And again, I know the, uh, the DXY or the U.S. dollar index, that's very Eurocentric. So, and we're at parity right now, meaning essentially one for one. One dollar gets you one euro and vice versa. Okay, so let's talk about what this really means for earnings. I saw some, some numbers, I think it was Goldman Sachs uh, had a report out that said about 30% of U.S. sales or, uh, yeah, sales from U.S.-based companies come from overseas. And the next thing you're hearing a lot of talk about is, well, I don't know. I don't know if, um, I mean, granted, look, I mean, Microsoft said it. They, they pre-announced, I think it was a couple of months ago. It might have been last quarter's release. They said, we're warning on our guidance because we think our revenues will be down, our earnings will be down a little bit uh, based upon the currency conversion. And it'll be interesting to see how many times this is brought up. But what's the actual thing that's happening in Q2? And FactSet had a, a report out, somebody passed to me, um, that actually shows a different story. They're not showing a lot of negative effects. Let me go through this. And I'll also say that many companies have currency hedging programs. So if you're a really large company and you know you're going to do a lot of sales in one country or another, you can sort of fix or hedge your interest rate differentials there. You can use futures, you can use options on futures. And so especially, you know, companies might do this if if they're doing something now and they're expected to be paid, you know, six, seven months from now, they can say, okay, let's let's sort of lock in this exchange rate by using uh, futures. But, you know, that's, let's leave that off the scope of this, uh, this podcast. So FactSet uh, came out with this thing. They said S&P 500 earnings growth in Q2 2022. That's this quarter currently. And what they did was they said S&P companies with greater than 50% revenue in the U.S., so less, um, less apt to be hurt by a strong U.S. dollar, okay? Um, you know, because if, if your revenue is in the U.S. and people are paying in dollars, you know, anyway. So um, there, uh, and then they looked at S&P companies with less than 50% revenues in the U.S. And they did this two ways. Let's see what they did here. They did, uh, this is earnings growth. So S&P companies, less than 50% revenue in the U.S., their earnings growth was 10.2%. And S&P companies with greater than 50% revenue in the U.S., only plus 1.2%. So those, those are earnings. And I think this is blended, um, almost positive it's blended. And, and what that means is, Look, not not every company has reported yet for Q2. And so this is looking at estimates blended with actual company, you know, so we have estimates plus actuals. And I think only at this point, I don't, not even sure if maybe a third of the companies have reported. I could be wrong there. It could be less. And then revenues. So same thing, greater than 50% revenue in the U.S., revenues up 9.4% versus Outside the U.S., up 14.6%. Okay, so according to this, maybe it's not as big of a deal. And all the worry about the strong dollar is more worry than anything else. Maybe they've, they've hedged their currency moves. So I don't know that. I don't know what's on the individual company's books. I think as we get some of the big players, especially this week, we have a huge earnings week with Apple. I think Amazon too, um, but we've got some of the big companies, especially in, in tech, but Apple will be an interesting one too. And Apple, Apple will be an interesting one too because they have, uh, you know, they, they manufacture things like iPhones overseas and, and then they sell them here. They sell them all over the world. And so they're, they're getting revenues all over the world, but they're also manufacturing in different spots of the world. So... You know, that's, that's kind of a, a thing to, uh, to keep an eye out. I do want to mention there's another nuance with the strong U.S. dollar that is detrimental, especially in emerging market uh, companies, uh, companies, countries. And this is kind of a, a big deal and, and something I think to, to watch. 
before I do, though, just to kind of tie the, the bow around this whole thing of um, you sort of manufacture one place, you sell in others, and then you repatriate revenue, i.e. your earnings back to your home country. It gets a little complicated when you have these multifaceted things. Um, just going back to our original example, we tend some we sell something for ten euros when it's a you know a dollar fifty conversion, dollar uh, fifty US gets you one euro. So we sell something for ten euros, uh, converted back to US dollars, repatriated the the revenue back to the US. You get fifteen dollars, and then we say okay. Well, let's let's use the example where uh, we got a fifteen dollar thing, and it cost us, you know, two bucks to make. We make it in Japan. All right. So our profit margin here in this example is what is it? Thirteen bucks. Okay. Well, now we go from a thirteen dollar profit margin. Let's say we make that thing in Japan. Great. Cost us less. Cost a dollar. Let's, let's just round it to a dollar fifty instead of two bucks. Awesome. So my profit margin should go up, right? Wait a second. Manufacture in Japan cost us a buck fifty, you know, converted back to US. We sell something for 10 euros, gets repatriated back at ten dollars. Oh, well now my profit margin is uh, eight fifty instead of thirteen. You kind of see how that all works. It's all interrelated. And sometimes you have multi, you know, sometimes these parts are sourced in multiple countries and then you've got to have sales in multiple countries. So it just kind of gets a little complicated. But I hope I hope I didn't confuse anybody. I hope I uncomplicated it because sometimes it can be confusing. And most people have maybe gone on a trip to a different country and you go to the airport and um, you exchange your currency and actually don't exchange it at the airport. It's a lot of fees and the spreads are really wide. Uh, do it at maybe a local bank or uh, anyway, that's a separate show. All right, US, US dollar denominated debt, foreign debt. Okay, so what a lot of countries do is they might borrow in their own currency. Like we issue treasury uh, notes and bills and bonds and those are in US dollars. So we also control our currency. Uh, we print our own currency and some people say we print too much of it. There's too much in the money supply. That's a, we'll hold that for another episode. But what happens when, let's say, a country, an emerging market country, and it could be any country, actually. It doesn't have to be emerging. But let, let's say, let's, let's use um, Brazil, for example. Let's say Brazil wants to issue bonds, and they can issue in their own currency, the Brazilian real, and they would float the bonds. Well, what happens is there's a market for U.S. dollar denominated debt. What that means is Brazil floats bonds, and instead of floating them in Brazilian real, um, they issue the bonds. I say float. They issue the bonds as a U.S. dollar denominated bond, which means they borrow in U.S. dollars. Let's say they borrow a thousand bucks U.S. And the coupon is 5% a year. Okay, so you owe 50 bucks. Fantastic. Well, that's all well and good because when you issue that bond, you say, okay, well, a currency is, um, you know, a certain amount converted back to US dollars. But if this dollar gets really strong, now you need more of your own currency to convert into the US dollars to make the debt payments or to pay off the principal upon maturity. And so it, it's kind of interesting. Um, and I, I know in, in the late 90s, we've seen different instances of this becoming a problem where these countries where their dollar is getting weaker, they have to it cost them more and more of their own currency to pay down the US dollar denominated debt. So I don't think we've seen anything uh, yet, and I'm not saying we will. And may maybe they've hedged. Maybe they they have a hedging program where they're using options or futures to, to hedge against the weakness in their own currency. I don't know. But this is something to watch. And, you know, we typically, a lot of times, I remember back in 1994, uh, the Mexican peso, they decided to devalue it. And all that means is, 
they used to peg their currency within a certain range to the U.S. dollars. And for lack of, you know, it's a little more of a longer explanation, but that means they either buy or sell currency to, to keep it within the bands. But when interest rates rose in 1994, you saw some things kind of come to the surface. Uh, one of them was a, the Mexican peso devaluation. Uh, late nine, 1998, they called it the Asian contagion, where there was some stuff in the Thai bot and some of the, the emerging market countries uh, that started. So I bring this up because it's, it's just something to keep an eye on. But I want you to understand that um, not every country, I mean, it kind of be like if, if we floated debt, we issued, let's say, instead of issued U.S. treasuries and U.S. dollars, imagine we issued a, a U.S. treasury, but it was denominated in euros. And we did it right now when it's basically one-to-one. So we issue $1,000. Okay, cool. But what if the, the euro goes to two? Meaning now instead of needing one US dollar equals one euro, now you need two US dollars to equal one euro. And let's say we're, we're doing a 5% coupon. Okay, so it costs us 50 bucks a year. But we're doing this as a euro denominated bond. Well, now we need 100 bucks a year to cover that $50 because the euro has strengthened. We're, we have to come up with more of our own currency to pay that same interest payment in euros, okay? So that, that's kind of what I'm talking about. And it's great if your own currency is getting stronger. It costs less in your own currency to pay back the debt. Um, but that's just something to watch. So, all right, folks, we're going to leave it here. As always, uh, you can give me a uh, reach out to me at Derek.Moore at ZegaFinancial.com, D-E-R-E-K dot M-O-O-R-E at Z is in Zebra, E is in Eddie, G is in George, A is in Apple. Financial is up to you, spell correctly. I'll put some links in the uh, the show notes. And uh, please do, uh, if you have a second, uh, you know, d- instead of rating and reviewing and starring, I sh- you can do that too, but only five stars. If you're not going to give five stars, don't, don't rate and review it. Uh, go ahead and share these podcasts with someone who you think might be interested in them or someone that might be helped by this content. So uh, I appreciate you doing that. We always like to hear from uh, listeners, so keep the emails coming. And we'll talk to you all next week. Bye.